Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. And literally, the picture there is that where sin ran like a river, grace did turn the tide of the river. It overran the river and turned it around. Hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful. If you have your Bibles, turn to the book of Esther, the book of Esther, and uh, chapter number six, chapter number six is where we want to take and speak from for a little while tonight. We want to continue the thought, too close, okay, we want to continue the thought that we started in chapter number five. On the story of the cross, chapter number five will awaken the king to certain aspects of the cross, and chapter number six and seven are going to lead him further into the truth of the cross of our Lord Jesus. Now, in chapter number five, uh, Esther comes before the king in peril of her own life. And the only way she can escape certain death is to risk her life and gain favor with the king. And certainly it was a breathtaking moment as she stood there uh, in the palace of that Persian monarch. Uh, the palace itself was some 250 feet long and she was just a small little frail of a woman on that end. And the uh, throne was down here on this end. And those marble columns uh, certainly made her appear as just very small and trembling. And uh, yet the king held out that golden scepter to her and knowing that she had risked her life to come into his presence and she found favor in the eyes of the king and she touched the top of the golden scepter and took her place as the queen. The king has said to her, now, honey, what do you want? And uh, he says, what, what, what's thy request? I know you've come here for a reason because it would be more than just an a impromptu meeting, uh, you know. And so he asked her what she would like, and, and in essence gave her a blank check up into half the kingdom. And so that's where we've, we, we, we've come through chapter number five. And, and of course she says, well, I'd like for you to come to a dinner that I've made prepared for you and Haman. And they do, and the king asked her again, oh, "Honey, what would you like?" And uh, up to half the kingdom, what would you what would you have? Now, you know those those kings. Uh, I guess that was their way of really expressing their desires towards uh, their queens. And uh, she didn't answer him. She gave a delay. She said, "Well, tomorrow." If you'll come to a banquet, I'll tell you then. And with her wisdom and her uh, cleverness, uh, she delays making that request. She's waiting for the right time, the right season. And so the king is, he, his interest is stirred up, you know. And uh, there's a span of time where the king has time to think about what's going on. And at the same time that the king is allotted this time to think before the next banquet, God is moving behind the scenes to expose the real character of Haman. Now, whether you realize this or not, there's a lot of things that's going to take place between these two banquets. There's a lot of uh, 
uh, things that take place in the delay. Now, chapter number six illustrates some tremendous practical truths for us. Now, I'm, 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 I'm hesitant, but I'm not going to capitalize on those truths because I want to get to the spiritual implications. But let me just give you an idea, you know. You can't help but to see them as you go through this chapter. I guess you could write at the top of the chapter, pride goeth before a fall, you know. And a haughty spirit. All of that is so in chapter number six. But uh, God oftentimes raises the humble uh, and puts down the proud. Often he does that. You take Saul and David. When Saul was little in his own eyes, God had raised him up. But he got puffy and, and the next thing you know, he's on the bottom, David's on the top. And so oftentimes God does that. And so chapter number six uh, just helps us to understand two or three things in a very practical way. God often promotes those that least anticipate a promotion. Those that least do. Mordecai was not anticipating a promotion. Uh, he's under the sentence of death. He's clothed in sackcloth and crying and mourning at the king's gate. All he has to look forward to is dying. And so uh, God promotes him and certainly he does that in chapter 6. And then also you might recognize this, that God often uses those who least deserve it. Of anybody who did not deserve to be used... The king, Artaxerxes, did not deserve to be used. He was a wicked individual. Very uh, uh, strung, strung out, you know. He, he, was, he was a very moody individual. You know anybody that would have the waves beaten with chains because it interfered with his march to Greece, you know that individual's half crazy. Anybody have the least person to have been considered usable would have been him. And yet God oftentimes uses those who least deserve to be used. Then again, a third idea in this chapter is this, that God oftentimes judges those who don't expect it. Oh, Haman thought he is on top. He didn't feel like he deserved judgment. He felt like he deserved being exalted, you know. But it proved the other way as you read that chapter. Now our focus tonight, and has been our focus in the book, is the story behind the story. It's our story. And God brings us into light. And that's what he's doing. God is bringing us into light concerning the full significance of the death of our Lord Jesus so that we might walk in the resurrected life of Christ. He wants us to live and manifest himself to this world, but the only way we can do it is through the power of the resurrection. And so he has to bring that light upon us. And so he brings us to the significance of the cross and its application to our lives. Now, in chapter number five, he's dealt with some of those preliminary preparations, you know. How Mordecai gets the message to Esther and now how Esther has gained audience with the king and uh, has, is laying the groundwork for further revelations, you know. And so that's chapter number five. But in chapter number six, it deals with some things that go on behind the scene. Things that Esther is not aware of. And uh, think, in fact, in chapter number six, the king, Mordecai, and Haman are the characters. Everything is centered around 
them. And so in this chapter, uh, he's going to make some uh, revelation about Haman and some revelation about Mordecai uh, behind the scenes. This might be considered a chapter where providence takes hold and it, it opens the eyes of the king. Now, it's so apparent as you and I read this chapter the contrast between Haman and Mordecai. But the king doesn't know that. And so there's got to be a revelation of the character of Haman to the king. And it's got to be so apparent that it is so appalling that when it comes to making a decision, there's really no decision to make. The king immediately chooses Mordecai over Haman. Now, I just want to say this on the outset. I'll probably say it in just a minute. But learning about our flesh and its domination in our life, that is not a simple and insignificant revelation. Whether you realize or don't realize, your flesh in your mind is your friend. And every, we, we are in love with ourselves. And it really takes an act of God to get us loosed from loving ourselves. Now I want you to see tonight something about brother, uh, uh, about uh, the king and about Haman and Mordecai that perhaps will help us to see a little bit about more about the difficulty that, and the struggle there is in dealing with the flesh. Now the revelation of Haman's character is a ticklish matter. Haman is the king's friend. And you don't just come up to a Persian monarch and tell him that his, king, his friend is a villain. So he's got, it's got to be dealt with carefully. Now, I'm going to center my thoughts around three things. And uh, I don't even know if I'll ever get back to them, but I'll give them, I'll give them to you as we're going through that. The first one I want to draw your attention to is those first three verses. And as we go down through these verses, I want to get to the place where you can see that, that God arouses a spirit of gratitude in the king. A spirit of gratitude in the king. This is going to be a momentous event. It's going to be a big thing. Now, you know, I've always been impressed how God can take and hang big things on little nails. He can take and do big things all uh, out of what may seemingly be uh, uh, trivial things. God is able to, to just anchor major things on. Here's a restless king. He cannot sleep. And because of his insomnia, he's going to end up saving his empire just because he couldn't sleep one night. Now, notice, if you will, these first few verses we're going to see that the king's going to make a discovery. It says, on that night. Now, that's pretty significant in itself because if Haman has his way, this is the eve of the execution for Mordecai. He's already got it planned out. He's already erected the gallows in chapter number five. And he's going to the king's house to get permission to impale Mordecai on that 75 foot pole so everybody can see Mordecai's death. And so uh, on that night, uh, you know, God's timing is something, ain't it? Have you ever marveled about God's timing? I've marveled at God's timing. It's always perfect. 
Everything seemed to be at a loss. In fact, it looked like the knife has been raised up, fixing to be plunged into the heart of Isaac, the glittering in the sun, and it looks as if he's fixing to go down with it, and God stays the hand of Abraham from slaying his son. And sent a ram up on the other side of the mountain. You know, God's timing. I was thinking about God's time and then I thought about old brother Peter. Herod had him locked up in jail and his execution for his in the morning and that night the angel of the Lord came and had to wake Peter up to get him out of jail. God's timing. And uh, it wasn't an accident whenever Philip left that revival over yonder, went down there, and in a desert land met an Ethiopian eunuch that was reading the book of Isaiah and was ready for the gospel net to draw him in. That wasn't an accident. It was God's timing. It wasn't an accident whenever Paul went down by the riverside and there he met a woman by the name of Lydia. All of these things were God's divine providences at work to accomplish God's divine plan. That night, the king had insomnia. It was a servant of Abraham who said that I've been in the way the Lord led me. And so, God's providence. Here's a restless king. A sleepless night, that night could not the king sleep and he commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles that were read before the king. Sleepless. Now there's a lot of reasons people can't sleep. Some of you may have sleep trouble tonight. But there's a lot of reasons people can't sleep. But I, I read this over in the book of Ecclesiastes. It said the sleep of a laboring man is sweet. Can I have an amen right there? Kind of a weak amen right there, wasn't it? The sleep of a laboring man is sweet. And he goes on to say whether he eat a little or much. That means a man that works hard can sleep at night. But the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. It's possible to have so much that you worry so much about what you've got, it robs you of being able to sleep at night. Y'all know that? that? That's true. I tell you it is. A lot of things keep us from being able to sleep. Sometimes people are sleepless because their mind won't let them rest. You know? It just keeps wandering here, there. just everywhere. You, it's just, you're just working all night or you're doing something. Just, your mind won't let you rest. Sometimes people can't sleep. Sister's over here. She See her legs working. She, this, some people can't sleep because they drank the coffee too late. Huh? Eat the pizza too late or whatever, you know, they just can't sleep. And uh, then there's some folks, and here's what he says here. The literal idea behind this verse is that the Lord takes his sleep away. God wouldn't let him sleep. Now, God oftentimes whispers to us during night seasons. He'll nudge us. Something that we have not attended to in the hustle of the daylight, God brings to our mind in the night season. he ever kept you awake over something you, you might have said to somebody during the daytime and, and boy you just wanted to get that thing right it offended somebody and you wanted to get it straight you know. maybe something you did that just wasn't right up to par and it needed an explanation and, and, and you laid there and you, the God just nudged you and he said you know now that really probably wasn't the right thing to do. Uh, has that ever happened to y'all? I tell you, I've lost some sleep on it like that. And God keep you awake. Or maybe God instruct you during that time. It, uh, whatever the reason, the king was awake. 
The king called for the record of the chronicles to be read. Now you know what that is. That's the history books. And uh, these are, of course, the books of the accomplishments of the king during his reign. Now I don't know what it is about men. I say it, don't I do? And boys, that makes them like to hear stories about themselves. You know, your children, sometimes you, you want to tell them a little story and it'll be all, all fabricated around them. They just seem to love it. Men are like that. And uh, if we can't tell the story, we sure like to hear the story, you know. And we're not going to stop you from telling somebody about how accomplished we are. And so the king opens up these chronicles, or they, he has the chronicles brought before him to read of the accomplishments of his reign. And uh, uh, this servant, he opens up the chronicles and he begins to read at a certain place. And at this certain place, the story is found over in the last verses of chapter 2. It said he found written that Mordecai had told of Big Thathia, or whatever his name is, and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers at the door, who sought to lay hands on King Ahasuerus. He read the story that's given to us over there in the latter part of chapter number two where Big Than and Teresh, they were going to slay the king. It was known to Mordecai. Mordecai certified it to Esther. Esther told the king about it and it was squashed. The coup was squashed. That was normal for a kingship. They were always on the lookout for an insurrection. They wanted to know what was going on in their kingdom. And most of the time, that individual would have been immediately compensated for his efforts and what he did. I'm saying to you, this is what happened. The king suddenly became aware that Mordecai had been the means of deliverance from him, for him from that evil plot of those two men. Now it is not that the king did not know the facts. He was familiar with what had happened. He ordered their execution. But this time he is, he, he is uh, startled with the reality and the significance of what Mordecai did. The significance of the event. He sees for the first time what he had not seen before. Had it not been for Mordecai, the king would have been the victim of an assassin's knife. And it dawns on him that the only reason he's alive is because Mordecai was aware of a plot and took the efforts to delay it. And so, he becomes aware of Mordecai. And um, he's, and here's my point. He not only makes a discovery, but he realizes that he's got a debt that he owes to Mordecai. And so the king becomes aware of a debt that he owes. What hath been done? What dignity, what honor hath been done unto Mordecai for this, the king says. The king's servant says, well, king, nothing's been done for him in verse number three. And uh, uh, this is a little speculation, but I say he could have probably added two or three things. He could have added something like this. Not only has nothing been done, but when they, we told you about it, it didn't seem like you cared too much at the time. In fact, uh, it really didn't seem to concern you after you've taken and dealt with the culprits. 
In fact, King, you were probably preoccupied with other things. Now the reason I say that is this. It's possible for a man to live for years, I guess, strangely unmoved about that great and amazing love of God that rescued him from perishing. They profess saving faith and yet they're preoccupied with so many other things. I wouldn't want you to have anybody race through your mind but you know, do you know somebody that might be professing saving faith whose life is preoccupied with so many other things? That's not too distant from this king right here. In fact, it might not be too distant from some of us. The facts are known to the king. He knows the facts. And yet, though he knows the facts, these facts seem unrelated to him. And until there is a fuller revelation of the significance of that cross, until he loses some sleep and God opens his eyes, his restless, troubled soul gets confronted with the claims of a neglected Savior, he'll go on preoccupied with things in this world. But brother, you ever let you ever let that fuller revelation come in about the significance of that cross and how it applies to us. There's something going to transpire. And uh, uh, that's exactly what, what's happened here. What hath, what dignity, what honor hath been done to Mordecai for this? Boy, his eyes have gotten open. He sees something that it was there. He knew it, but he didn't know it. You know. Now, this is the story. Boy, I love it. This is the story. The story of our deliverance through the blood of our gracious and wonderful Redeemer. This is the story that God breaks in on us in order to deliver us from this old man of Adam. He makes that cross to be real to us. He makes it to be significant to us. He makes it applicable to our lives. We realize we have been bought with a price. Oh, I tell you, friend. I'm talking about when the Holy Spirit brings before us that truth and awakens in us that the flesh is not our friend. It's our enemy. We're not our own. We do not have the right to live our life like we want to. We've been purchased. When that dawns on us, business picks up in our heart. Can I tell you this? Not only are we not our own, And not only are we bought with with a price, but the one, the only one you can completely and fully trust is the one to whom you owe your whole life. It's Mordecai. He's the only one in the kingdom looking out for the king. Now the discovery, the discovery that our Lord Jesus has the right to my life That's the basis for all the deliverance, all of the victory that I'm going to have as a child of God. That's the basis of it right there. If you want to live in victory, you want to walk walk in the power and joy of the Lord, it's going to be based on the fact that Christ hath delivered us from sin through his blood. Now, I'm not talking about an abstract knowledge 
some way I taught her. Now I'm not talking about a, a, I can recite a certain creed or believe a certain doctrine type knowledge. No, I'm talking about a personal involvement, real, vital, breaking in on our heart truth that I have no right to live a life that he does not approve. Y'all hear me? I'm talking about, I'm talking about, that's the basis of this thing. He that risked his life, no, he that gave his life is our truest friend, our truest friend. Now, it's a pretty significant moment. Now, the king doesn't know what Haman's got on his mind, you know. He doesn't understand Haman's true character, but he knows this. All of a sudden, he's been enthralled with the cross of Christ. He's, he's got a fresh revelation of the love of God in Christ Jesus. And for the first time, the king realizes Mordecai is his friend. And uh, it is, creates a gratitude, a spirit of gratitude in the king. What hath been done? How can I dignify, how can I honor Mordecai? Well, about that time, of course, there's nothing been done for him. Verse number four, the king, I, I, I mean, the king, who's in the, who's in the court? I, I, I need somebody to help me. Who's in the courtyard? Guess who's coming up? Old brother Haman is on his way. And uh, the king, when he makes that discovery, he's so delighted, he wants to get Mordecai and, and bless him right then, you know. Verse number four says, Now Haman was come to the outward court of the king's house to speak unto the king to hang Mordecai. Here's a tremendous, in these verses right here, they're verse number four down about verse number, oh, but verse number 12. You're going to see some tremendous contrast. And here's the contrast. There's going to be a contrast between real honor and humility, that's Mordecai, and real hatred and hypocrisy. That's going to be Haman. Ultimately, the king is going to have to choose the friendship of one or the other. Now, in chapter number five, we saw that the Holy Spirit, Esther, the Holy Spirit, Mordecai and Esther, the Holy Spirit may be or bring a conviction within the human spirit Mordecai lets Esther know that there's trouble, you know. But he doesn't necessarily articulate what's wrong to the king. He hasn't put it in words to the king. And so the king does not yet know about the real character of Haman. Mordecai has revealed it to Esther but it's not been shown to the king yet. And so look at verse number five. The king, well, verse, speak to Mordecai, to hang, hang Mordecai on the gallows, which he had prepared for him. And the king's servant said unto him, Behold, Haman standeth in the court. And the king said, Let him come in. So Haman came in. And the king said unto him, I'm talking about he didn't give him a chance to say anything. The king said, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought, Haman thought in his heart to whom would the king delight to honor more than to myself. You talk about somebody who is ego, what do you call it, egocentric, is that it? Egocentric, completely obsessed with himself. Someone who has such a great sense of his own self-worth. You know, you talk about somebody who is feeling like he is self or taken up with his self-importance. This is Haman. 
And all of the things that he suggests to the king about honor are all measures that he is suggesting to advance himself. You see, really, Haman would like to be the king. And, and he's setting everything up to where if something happened to Artaxerxes, he could be the king. He's got a twisted mind. But I'll tell you what he does in his twisted mind. He knows what honor it really is. He really knows what honor is. Now this flesh knows what honor is. Look at what he says in verse number seven. Haman answered the king, for the man whom the king delighteth to honor, let the royal apparel be brought which the king used to wear. And the horse that the king rideth upon and the crown royal which is set upon his head and let this apparel and the horse be delivered into the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor, and bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the king, or to the man whom the king delighteth to honor. He knows what honor really is. He's, uh, he's acquainted with, he knows what it is. Even though his mind is twisted and it's locked on himself and uh, uh, he still knows what honor is. Now let me say this and I, I, I don't want to sound like I'm, I, I'm berating a, a truth but somehow we have come to the place and it's because of the Haman in us that we feel like we have a right to all the breaks in life. You know, when something happens negative to us, we'll find ourselves getting bitter about it if we're not careful. Or somebody's advanced over us, you know, they get the breaks. We feel like we deserve the breaks in life. And uh, oh, Haman, that's what he's doing. He's feeling like he deserves all the breaks, ought to get them and gets mad and resentful and bitter if things don't go his way. I've said a lot and I believe strongly about the fallacy of the entitlement generation that we've raised up. Do y'all know what I mean? I mean everybody's entitled something. If you ain't careful, I'll tell you what Haman does. Haman feels like he's entitled to some things too. And so, so Haman the flesh, he knows what honor is. Let me tell you what he says. True honor, here it is. True honor is to give oneself to another publicly. To give oneself to another Your clothes, that royal pair, if you'll set them on, your horse, where, the place where you used to sit, put him there. And get one of the most noble men in the kingdom to take and lead, the, lead him through and proclaim this ought to be done to the man. He's owning him publicly. Y'all see that? Let me tell you. Come on. Come here. I want to help him. First time you helped him by preaching a long time, ain't it? Just a child. Huh? You see old Owen here? Owen's my friend. Yeah. I'll tell you what he's going to be downtown. He's going to be my friend. And I'll tell you something else. Owen, I don't, I don't, come on, son. Don't. I, don't, I don't mind walking down the road with you. No. Yeah. i tell you what. I got a few shirts I'm going to give you. I got some Carhartt shirts that look like they fit you. To, to, I don't know. They might be fitting me better. I, I, don't, I don't mind. Hey, you, listen, you, know, you, you see what I'm telling you? Real honor is to identify with the person publicly. And the flesh knows that. 
knows that. And that's why he says, thank you, Brother Owen. Appreciate you helping me out on that little deal. Get those glasses. I want you to see this thing. Yeah, it's what friends do. The flesh knows what real honor is. Now keep that in mind. Here's what Jesus said. Anyone that serves me, the Father will honor him. How does the Father honor those that serve Christ? He honors them by giving himself to them. Is that right? Yeah. Do we honestly want to honor Christ? Do we honestly want to give him dignity, the one that we owe our life to, that's rescued our life? Then the only way we can really honor him is to wear his clothes, wear his crown, the authority in our life. Let him have it. Your body. Here it is. Paul said, present your bodies a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service on him publicly. Grant him the right to rule over every area of our life. Now Haman, he fancied himself going through the streets and everybody bowing and one of the king's great men, you know. Here's the man, Haman, that's, that's the way he fancied himself. But I'll tell you, his eyes got open right there in that next phrase. It said, it said in verse number 7, Haman answered the king, for the man down there in verse number 10 says, and the king said to Haman, make haste, <laughs> take the apparel and the horse that thou hast said, do even so to Mordecai. Whoa, good night. No, not to Mordecai, the Jew. Do to Mordecai, the Jew, that sitteth at the king's gate. Let nothing fall of all that thou hast spoken. Oh, man, what are you talking about? You talk about rage. Now, Haman's too smart to explode right there in public. He's too clever for that. But you can, you can tell that the blood left his face, brother. He turned white as a ghost at that little remark. You talk about humiliation taking over. But Haman's able to keep his cool, and he's able to control his feelings. Uh, it's obvious to Haman that something's happened to the king. And of course, uh, what has happened is that, that he has rediscovered Mordecai. You know, he was reading in the book and he rediscovered Mordecai. And I'm going to tell you where you'll rediscover Mordecai is when you go to reading in the book. Hallelujah. And it did happen to the king. And, uh, and so the king's going to honor Mordecai. It's too dangerous for Haman to show his intent right now. It's become a matter of self-preservation for him. <laughs> I might say this. The king, oh, I've got to quit saying anything. I get all sidetracked on these things. But the king, the king, the king wasn't trying to humiliate Haman when he told him to lead Mordecai through there. No, the king didn't even really know what Haman's nature was. He was innocent in this thing. He doesn't know that Haman has a hatred for Mordecai. Now having said that, let me say this, and, and this is pretty ticklish here. It's, that's the very same reason we at times use the energy of the flesh to try and honor We harness the energy of the flesh with a desire to exalt the Lord. Now the flesh, of course it has its origin with the devil. You know that and I know that. The flesh will go along with everything you want to do as a Christian as long as you let it live. The flesh will do anything you want him to. Just don't let him die. 
The flesh will let you sing in the choir like an angel. Flesh will let you take and preach a sermon. The flesh will let you take and lead meetings. The flesh will let you take and teach Sunday school. The flesh will let you organize evangelistic campaigns. It'll let you do anything you want to do as long as you do it in the energy of the flesh. And that's what makes it so deadly. That's what makes it so dangerous. All the things the flesh will let you to do under the domain of religion. And uh, as long as you don't put it to death. Hebrews chapter number 5 speaks about the characteristics of those that are spiritually immature. They're not able to discern between good and evil. Paul called them babies, Christians, you know. The Galatians, foolish Galatians, he said, having begun in the spirit, are ye now made perfect through the works of the flesh? Haman did what he's commanded to do. The king, he's full of enthusiasm. He just wants to bless the Lord and, and praise God. He's all going to do something to honor the Lord. He doesn't know that he's doing it in the flesh. He doesn't know that he's taking in and on, trying to honor God through the means of the flesh. He's totally un, unexpected about this thing. He's unsuspicious about it. Now, I'm going to say this now. Don't throw no rock at me. I've only got this much more to go. Okay? Don't, don't throw no rock at me. But sometimes the means and the methods that we use in the church world are heavy laden with the flesh. Everywhere from our music to our preaching our teaching, to our singing, and it becomes a fair show in the flesh. See, the, the flesh will do anything to survive. It'll take the commands of the king. It'll do anything. It'll go through the streets saying this ought to be done. Lead Mordecai to the man that the king wants to honor. And so Haman did what he's commanded. He's... Uh, uh, his tactics. Now I'm not questioning I'm not questioning the genuineness of love for Christ. Y'all understand that? I'm not questioning that. But I'm just saying sometimes it's the flesh that's being exalted rather than Christ. Righteousness of the flesh is always counterfeit righteousness. It's always self-righteousness. And the Bible says Romans 8 verse number 8 that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. The only way to deal with the flesh is death. It's got to die. Because he can put on a pretty show. That leads me to the third little point, And that is one step left. Those last two verses, one step left. I believe old Haman has a premonition of what's going on. Now, true humility, it said at Mordecai, Whenever he got through going on that parade, he just went back to the gate. Haman, he turned and went, head bowed down, hoping nobody recognized him, headed to the house, you know. And when he got there, he said, Haman told Zerus, his wife, verse 13, and all the friends, everything that had befallen him. He said to his wise men, Zerus, his wife said to him, If Mordecai be of the seed of the Jews before whom thou hast begun to fall, Thou shalt not prevail. You know what they're saying, don't you? They're saying, Haman, you're trashed. <laughs> Everything's stashed to get stacked against you now. You've already started on a downward journey. They're going to expose you, buddy. You see, really, the flesh doesn't have any friends. It don't have no friends. And uh, uh, here's some, some prophecies of impending death that his wife and his friends are giving him. What they're doing, they're saying the end is real near. You've already started on this downward slope. The king is going to see through you after a while. 
And about that time, the doors bust open. Hey, Haman, it's time to go to dinner with the king and Esther. I'll tell you what's happening. Haman is fixing to eat the last supper. God's going to take and reveal. Mordecai's going to take and reveal. Esther's going to take and reveal the wickedness of Haman to such a degree that that it's not even a choice to be made. The king is going to choose Mordecai and Haman is going to the gallows. That's the next chapter. All right? All right. I quit. Quit. We're going to have to cut out a song, I guess, sometime. <laughs>